Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Monday Night Muse. I'm your humble host, Sound Engraver, and uh, I'm going to make sure audio is good, as always. So let me go ahead and check my YouTube, make sure it's good. Uh, there's a bit of a lag there, so I'll have to wait. So is audio good, guys, as YouTube is loading up? <laughs> there it is. All right, so I, I I can hear me a little bit, but uh, maybe sure we'll go ahead and make sure the mic is nice and close. How are you guys? How are you guys doing? Um, I'm going to go ahead and welcome the chat, and we're just going to be talking about the benefits, the benefits of mastery. Yes, the benefits of mastering your skill, mastering your craft. Uh, we'll use... The example for me, uh, which is playing violin, having mastered an instrument, a musical instrument, and I'm more or less on the intermediate stage for composing as far as the music I want to produce. So give or take, we might use that as an example, but probably not. We'll probably focus on an actual tangible bit of proof, and that is the mastery of violin playing. Let's go ahead and welcome the chat. I, I think Big Al said bullseye couple hours ago, but then it, it, it disappeared. So I think Al was first. Bullseye. Yeah, that was good. And then Professor Geek, my, my handsome prof, says, I'm ready for the wisdom of my beautiful sage. I hope so. And then Dr. Y says, good evening, Americans. It's Monday. It is Monday. Actually, in some parts of the world, it's Tuesday right now. And Wolf 10 with his, oh, hey there, sound engraver. And audio is good. Awesome. Okay. We'll go back up to the chat to Horizon Talker. Welcome. And have a great stream, Sound Engraver. Thank you, Big Al. I do appreciate that. I'm ready for tomorrow night's book study. That's going to be fun. Uh, I just I just really do love that, that fifth book of the series. And then Owen Lister is in the house, says, good evening, everyone. Just got done watching the Superman three-part world's finest. Uh, is that three-part or three-partner world's finest? Still a better crossover than BBS. I, I, I've never watched any of that, but I could say probably for certain, yes, that's true. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure the, the prof will attest to something <laughs> in, 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 your, in favor of your comment. All right, and Melissa saying hello. Hi, Melissa. And Jedi Master Zetopia, welcome. And uh, Alienated Entity, welcome. Nice to see you. Uh, I, I don't think I've seen you before, but if you are part of the profs community, of course, welcome. Or if you just saw a very attractive thumbnail with green and yellow and red and black. I love that color combination. I just, I got so excited with that, with that thumbnail. So thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So I think that's everyone. <clears throat> we'll get started with notes. Um, my voice is kind of dry for some reason. I'm not, not quite sure why. Um, could be the change of weather. I think that's everyone here. I'm going to go ahead and check YouTube real quick. All right. I I think that's it. So, oh, okay. Uh, Alienated Entity says, first time catching the streaming. Always I see hours later. Well, thank you. I, I hope you appreciate it live. There's always a, this thrill, this this thrill I get when I see streams live instead of, you know, at the replay, as we say. Um, so hopefully I don't disappoint. <laughs> All right. So we'll go ahead and talk about mastery and the benefits of mastery. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my notes. Get a drink of water. I think I'll probably go through these notes quite quickly and then um, we'll have a discussion. And if there's anything I've left out or you want to add, please do so in the comments section. Um, but I'm going to talk about the benefits of mastery. So the benefits of mastery there are four categories. We've got the personal benefits, the intellectual benefits, the social benefits, and the economic benefits. So we'll start with the personal. And I do think the personal is 
more important. I think it's the most important. It's really uh, the benefit of your well-being. Uh, so mastering something really causes personal enrichment. The pleasure of something you've mastered is good for your mind and your heart and even your mood. So if you have a bad day, if you have a rough day at work, maybe uh, a rough thing happens with your family or friends or certain social circles, if you go to your craft, if you go to your skill, if you go to your art, if you go to your business, if, if you go to any of that, chances are, mo most likely, more, more often than not, you will be better. You will have a better mood. You'll have a, um, a much more, I would say, healthy understanding of the day. You will be content. You will have gratitude. This is my experience with the violin. I can have a rough work day, or I could have maybe a, a, a kind of an off day with teaching, or maybe an off day with something like streaming or YouTube videos, or maybe troubleshooting and super collider doesn't work very well. Well, if I go and take a break, and if I pull out my violin and, and play for half an hour, 45 minutes, there's something that actually keeps me centered. There's something about playing the violin that keeps me centered. Part of it is because I've been doing violin for almost 25 years now, and I have mastered the instrument. And there's there's something about being able to produce a beautiful tone, the, the physics of violin playing, uh, the way the violin feels under my fingers, the way it sounds to my ears, the, the, the motion of the bow and, and the, the motion of the arm, of the, of the right arm and, and the left hand and, and the you know, kind of the shrugging of the shoulders if, if you're playing something really expressive. That, all that, all those little things are, are good for my mood and my well-being. It, it really does keep me centered, especially when I play freestyle and I'm just doing some freestyle stuff in the bedroom or if I'm playing a, a classical piece, like a classical concerto or a sonata or even an etude. But there's, there's something about playing the violin that really keeps me centered, even when times are tough, when, when you're having a bad day. And so personal enrichment is part of your mastery. And I think, at least in my experience, it can be part of your every day, no matter the day, no matter the hard times, no matter the good times, it will always keep you centered. So personal enrichment is one benefit of the personal benefits. The, the next benefit is being versatile. So mastering your craft or having mastered your craft allows you to be versatile in different things. Now, I can only use my example as a musician, as a violinist, but maybe you have something as an artist or a business person, whatever the case may be. So for violin, I range from classical to freestyle. So I can play all the way from music from the 1500s, going all the way from there to uh, classical, as we know to be Mozart, Beethoven, Mendelssohn to the late Romantic composers to the Impressionistic composers like Debussy, uh, Satie, um, and also to the modern times with uh, let's see what was good oh John Creliana uh, he he's he's written a great violin sonata so I can go from you know I can cover centuries of music of Western style classical music. But then I can do popular music. I can do jazz music. I can do violin live processing with my electronic music. I can do fiddle. I can do bluegrass. I can do Irish. So I can do Irish fiddle. I can do American fiddle. You know, the, the traditional bluegrass, the traditional mountain music or the old time country music. So I can range from all sorts of styles and uh, all sorts of nuances and expression because I have mastered not just the instrument. I have mastered my musical sensibilities. And because of that, I can function in a variety of different settings. Or I would say maybe I would uh, serve as a violinist for different functions. You know, from the traditional ensemble set, uh, like a, a small, I would say, string quartet, or maybe a string trio, or maybe a traditional uh, 
um, I would say classical trio, you know, violin, cello, and piano, although that can vary. And I can also play in the orchestra. Now, I, I haven't played in the orchestra in probably a good, good 10 years. So I would have to accommodate. I'd have to more or less relearn how to do that professionally, especially. But I can perform in a variety of different ways from solo to, you know, solo acoustic to um, solo with the computer, with electronic music, uh, to, to the full orchestra. I could be a stage musician. I've been a stage musician on a couple of Shakespeare plays, some professional Shakespeare plays, and all, all that good stuff. I've been in the pit orchestra for opera and musicals. So I have the ability to go different places, you know, get paid for these different things, but also even just for fun, even for personal enrichment. If I had some professional friends who would say, hey, could you could you do this for one night? Um, you know, we'll we'll treat you out to a very special dinner afterward or something like that. Or, or if it's fun enough, I'll just do it for fun. Uh, but actually, now that I'm a professional, it's 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 really it. It really is. We'll, we'll get to the economic benefits later. But, <laughs> but yeah, the ability to do that either for fun or as a profession as well. And I'm also versatile in that I can play by ear, you know, in, in a setting like a, in a worship band. I can play by ear. I don't have to rehearse worship songs. I If I know the key, I'll know the chord progression so I can play by ear. And it ranges from playing by ear, not reading music, to reading very advanced music with a lot of different uh, pieces of notation and, and modes of expression. So I'm versatile on the violin. I'm, I'm versatile in this craft. So we talk about, we, uh, we talk about um, personal enrichment, being versatile, and confidence. Confidence is good. It's not ego. It's not arrogance. There's, there's a natural confidence that comes with mastering your craft and people register that people people know i you know i just i actually had a a new uh, child to teach online six years old actually she's going on to seven years old and you know i'm a little shy when it when it comes to meeting especially small children um and, and their parents I'm, I'm a little shy but i i you know i, I welcome them and and begin their, their trial lesson but I, I did it through online. I, I had an online exchange with a seven-year-old and, and her mother online. And if I didn't have that natural confidence for violin playing and also teaching violin, I think it would have been an awkward social situation. Uh, but she she latched on to what I was saying. She was very bright. She she laughed at my jokes. That was that was awesome. Like I didn't really tell any jokes, but she, she left. She thought I was funny. Uh, but that, that confidence, that rapport that I have with, you know, children of all ages to my adult students, you know, to people well into their sixties and seventies, that, that comes from a confidence that I've, I've established for myself over time with experience on the violin and, and my experience in music. So confidence is just a natural effect for having mastered your craft. And another personal benefit is the ability to establish amazing goals for yourself, but have these amazing goals be feasible, doable, achievable. What do I mean? Well, as an example, if I hear a piece that I like, let's say I hear a violin piece I had never heard before on YouTube, and it's quite advanced. Well, because of my mastering the instrument, I can read a piece, even if it's technically advanced, I can read and learn the piece on the spot. Of course, it would take practice. It would take a few goes, a few rehearsals to get to that performance stage. But I can learn difficult things rather quickly. And I can hear a piece of music. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to play that and I'm going to learn that. And it's going to be fine. It's not going to be something that, that's going to take another five to eight to ten years, as, as it had been when I was practicing mastering my craft or mastering my instrument. So those are the personal benefits. The intellectual benefits, that's the second item. You build intelligence. You keep building intelligence while you have mastered your craft and, and are progressing. It's like compound interest. It just is compounded all the time. No matter how old you get, no matter how experienced you are, 
you are constantly building your intelligence. Not only that, you are building your intellectual tenacity. You are staying disciplined. You are staying focused. You've probably expanded your attention span. Uh, your attention span. You've probably uh, you've probably been able to establish something of the cerebral muscle, but maybe the physical muscle. So, for instance, playing the violin is actually quite a, a physical thing. It doesn't require breath like a singer or um, that that stamina of breath as in, you know, playing the tuba. But there still is a lot to, to do with breathing and expression and articulation. There's a lot of uh, finger motion and, and flexibility. There's just a lot of motion from your core, almost like almost like you're a dancer. You do need to have posture with your shoulders pulled back and and your 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 chin is up and you're you're poised almost like you are ready to perform dance like dance ballet whatever the case may be probably not physically as strenuous it's not as physically as strenuous as ballet for instance but you do have um that ability to um be flexible have that muscle memory have that coordination um, so you are building a uh, an intellectual tenacity, but also a physiological tenacity as well. This can probably, I would say this would extend to things like drawing and, and, and sketches and, and painting and all of that. Of course, I'm just using those examples. There are many more, uh, many more things that... Um, that allow you to build your intelligence and your intellectual tenacity. One way you're building your intelligence and intellectual tenacity is that you have to realize that when you're mastering a craft or a skill, you're actually not building only on one skill. In most cases, you are increasing your intelligence across different skills, maybe even many skills. So my knowledge of the violin leads to my knowledge of sight reading, uh, reading music on the fly, composing, uh, ear training, seeing music on a page and, and humming the different pitches and their intervallic relationships and also rhythm. Um, ear training actually is more or less singing or humming, but uh, ear training is, is developing that inner ear that I can actually hear it and, and transfer it over to the violin playing. So sight reading, composing, ear training, music theory, music history, and general music analysis. Also, as I have said before, things like coordination and muscle memory and motor cognition. Um, it, it's, it's been in my experience with um, children with special needs like autism, they have this just really innate, like this very acute awareness of, of motor cognition with a, a musical instrument, uh, even, even with something as difficult as, as violin. So it really does help with um, uh, your brain at many, many different points. But again, this doesn't, this doesn't, um, it's, it's not exclusive to a musical instrument. This can go across different art forms and also different personal skills like, you know, uh, metal work and, and wood shop, you know, for instance. So, you, you know, kind of think, think, have, have an active imagination for those kinds of things. Like, oh, okay, well, what, what else, you know, besides the musical instrument? Uh, but going back to my violin playing, I've also been physically aware of spatialization. So spatialization with, with my eyes, seeing uh, the, the distance between notes on, on, on the musical staff, but not just spatialization on the page, but also my, my body, the, the spacing between my fingers, you know, between um, half steps and whole step spacing between my left hand, how I'm using the bow. Um, it's, it's working with the physical space in terms of, as I said, space between the fingers, the velocity, you know, the bow speed and, and all of that kind of dynamic expression, that physical dynamic expression. So those are, those are some ideas for intel, um, uh, intellectual benefits. So we talked about the personal benefits the intellectual benefits. Now let's talk about the social benefits. Mastery of something, anything. Mastery instantly garners respect. People have a natural respect and admiration when they see something done on the professional level. Because we know that mastery takes years of practice, discipline, 
dedication, personal dedication, and we respect that. Mastery of something is also serviceable. So the master can serve the community in a variety of different functions. So for musicians, we can attend church gigs, we can do worship, uh, we can, I mean, musicians are definitely wanted during Christmas time, you know, for Christmas performances and things like weddings and and dying, uh, dying. I was thinking, I was thinking funerals. I was about to say funerals, but I meant to say dining parties. So, so all those those social events where you know musicians are wanted. And just a side note, just kind of reminded me. I think didn't the Super Bowl have fake violins or something? Wasn't there like a whole wall of people that that violin players that were not violin players? I think the musician, the singer was an actual musician, but I, I think they actually, I don't think they hired actual violin players. I'd have to look at the video again, but it's, uh, I don't think they're violin players from, from the little I saw. Um, so that's kind of a slap in the face, <laughs> you know, no Super Bowl, come on, come on. You, you can't be so tight on a budget to not hire actual musicians to, to play for you. But in any case, a, a business, a, a, a sports event, a, a, any kind of event that um, are run by people with somewhat um, with, with some integrity. Uh, yeah, they, they would hire musicians for, for those social gatherings. So mastery of a musical instrument is serviceable, but you know, mastery of art in general is also serviceable. So, you know, you, you who um, illustrate, you, you might illustrate sketches, but you might also uh go across to, to, to provide concept art for different people, concept art for writers, concept art for filmmakers, and, and see where your skills uh, serve people in that regard. You could be the business person where you have a knack for different things. You have, you have talent for business. You have an eye and an understanding for business where you can also, um, uh, that, that could also in, involve interdisciplinary skills that, that cover many different kinds of projects. So masters are needed constantly for different occasions. Uh, you know, with, with things happening where every, everything seems to be remote, I would say that that's a little harder to com come by these days, especially with things like performance gigs. But it, the, I, I do believe there will be a comeback for hiring artists again on, on a on a good level, on a, on a substantial level, because you can't really take many shortcuts when it comes to art and, and the proficiency of art or the proficiency of playing, performing, composing, and, and all of that. So uh, I would say just kind of be patient and look around, but people really do look for genuine artists and, and artists who have uh, mastered their crafts and, and business people can't, can't leave business people out. The final social uh, benefit is that mastery brings delight to other people. That that you know benefits the other person. I I the times I did perform, you know, people would come up to me and and say, "Oh, you just played that so beautifully. You really made my day. You really made my afternoon. You really made the setting of this wonderful experience I had." I, I've played uh, for. <laughs> I've played for people on their birthdays, on their 80th birthdays or their 90th birthdays. I've played for anniversaries, 50, 60 anniversaries, you know, 60 year anniversaries. Uh, I've prayed, I've played for proposals. I've prayed, played, excuse me. I've played for um, marriage proposals where I'll, I'll get a young guy, you know, you know, ask me, hey, hey, can you play a love song? Any love song, it doesn't matter, but can you play something? Uh, romantic, and um, I'm about to propose to to my girlfriend. And by the way, I, it's beautiful, and I and I make it. I make that violin sing, and it's so lovely. I get so nervous when I see a proposal, but I, I try to do it and, and 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 play beautifully. And of course, she says yes. She she says yes. Um, but yeah, that was a uh, that that's always been nice. So people have honored. The, the the violin playing saying oh that's that's been that's I'll I'll cherish that 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 really made everything so so much better so I I think that's the best part of the social benefits is that it it 
your craft, your, your ability to do something actually provides service and benefits to other people. And then finally, the economic benefits. So the best part of having mastered the violin is I can teach violin and I can perform as, as a violinist. Not so much since 2020. I would say before 2020, it was really a thing where I would be getting these emails for different studios across central North Carolina saying, hey, we're in need of a violin instructor. And actually, even during the pandemic, people needed violin instructors, which is awesome. I, I thought I thought music lessons was, was going to, well, any anything, any extracurricular thing, if it costs money, is usually the first thing to go. Uh, but no, people stuck around and, and they've been needing lessons and music lessons to, to get their mind off and, and, and um, put their mind, you know, at ease because, you know, music and especially learning something, especially learning a hobby or something you like to do, it really does take the edge off of, you know, hard times, you know, what, what, what we've been presented, of course, this, this last year and, and people just need to take their mind off something. So they learn music, they, they take lessons. And I actually still have been on demand, you know, people are still, yeah, retention has always been a, a hard thing. And, and students have, yeah, students have definitely used the, um, you know, the 2020 as an excuse to quit lessons, because I knew they were quitting anyway. Uh, but, but also, I've, I've gotten new students, I've gotten more students. And so violin, I will always be able to teach violin as as at least a means of supplemental income, which is wonderful. It's wonderful because I know the violin like the back of my hand. And now that I teach, I've taught violin for, well, I've, more than three years, but three years, you know, pretty much part-time to full-time, uh, three years straight, almost four years, three and a half years. And so I know how to teach violin really well, as well as play violin really well. And so that's, that's the economic benefit for me is I, I can master something and I can also teach it as, as a way to, um, you know, pass on my knowledge, but also make income doing something I know, like the back of my hand. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really a privilege. It's a privilege, but it also took, you know, 20, 22 years of constant practice to get to this point. Uh, but that, that's, that's the benefit to you. You know, if you've mastered art or if you've mastered, um, business that you can kind of hire another person uh, as your apprentice or some, some something along those lines, or maybe uh, construct a business model or, a, you know, write a book or write a, you know, sell a pamphlet or sell a platform, you know, all the, all these different things. When you, when you've mastered your craft, you can actually generate at least supplemental income by providing it as a service. You can, you can charge others. So that's been amazing for me. And I, I would say it, it can, it can branch out from teaching, teaching violin to teaching composition, teaching music. I can teach beginning piano. I can teach music theory, all that good stuff. Now, as far as your actual mastering, uh, your, your, as far as your skill that you have mastered, when you've come to that point, when you've come to that point of proficiency, don't be afraid to charge a good rate. Don't be afraid to charge a good rate. You can charge a lot for your skill and experience. And I think people, first of all, you have to be honest with yourself. If you're not quite there, then don't charge the rate you want to charge. <laughs> but if you are there, uh, people actually do gravitate toward, oh, well, she charges more for violin and she's got this, this level of, of experience. I think I'm going to, I'm going to pay a little extra money for what she charges. Cause I know I'm going to get a, a return on the investment. Uh, it's, it's the same way I feel about a uh, massage therapist, for instance, I will pay more for a capable therapist than some generic, you know, massage envy experience. So I, I'm, I'm comfortable when, when I see a massage therapist charge an X amount of money, even if it's 10 or $15 more that hour, 
I, I gravitate toward that because I'm like, okay, they've, they've had very spe- specific training. They, they know the human body. They know how to get to those muscles. And that's how I am with violin. I know the violin so well. I know the technique so well. I know the technique to teach your kids or you uh, to, to, to spare you from carpal tunnel in the future and, and, and back pain and shoulder pain. I teach very good sufficient technique on the violin that causes the the violin playing to be very relaxed and also proficient. So you're not going to have hand set. You're not going to have hand surgery or neck surgery uh, with, with my teaching, with my technical skills. So I'm not afraid of, I, you know, I'm a contractor for studios, but if I were to do my own private studio, I would not be afraid of charging a lot of money because of my experience and what I have as far as technique, but also curriculum as well. And as far as jobs, your career can be flexible and lucrative depending on your location, where you live. Also uh, remote teaching, but also your equipment. So if you have a a studio or a a workstation or workspace that is is well equipped, you you probably could work remotely. Um, But if you live in an uh, optimal area, like a outside a, a good city. Oh yeah, you'll you'll find you'll find your clients no, no matter what you do. And lastly, on demand. You will be on demand. Depending on your skill and profession, you could be on demand. Violent instruction, that will for for cities, for for major cities or or at least large, you know, rather large cities, you know, averaging, I don't know, 250,000 to 500,000, maybe even 100,000 to 500,000. There will be music studios, but there will also just be people around the area saying, yeah, I'd I'd like my violin. um, I'd like my daughter to learn violin. Uh, So I think that will always be the case. People People like to learn stuff. They, They like to learn dancing. They like to learn cooking. They like to learn all these different things they love to learn. And I think a lot of people would would, would be happy to pay the money uh, for, for your service. I've, I've got kids students, but I've also got adult students that are fine with learning. So those are the economic benefits as well. I, and, and not only that, I, I've just scratched the surface for me because I've mastered music on, on a more all-encompassing level. I can find ways to generate income, you know, by by, by selling, of course, my albums and, and my original music, um, by composing music for a company or for a project, maybe maybe one day building my own sound library and selling it for dirt cheap. Uh, I know how to transcribe. I know how to write in the music software. I know how to uh, make music very very presentable, where I could sell a, a violin score for a dollar or two, you know, so I can, I can make videos on, on violin lessons and, and, and create, uh, you know, CD accompaniments, you know, um, music accompaniment that, that includes like a drum kit or a piano or something like that, that helps the person along. I, I've even contemplated in the next two to three years or so, depending, uh, writing a book on violin technique, because the more I teach, the more I realize, especially with my adult students, they, they get confused on very basic things. And I know why they're confused because the violin is actually a rather abstract instrument. And I like the, the books that I teach from, but you know, some, some of these books uh, really don't include a lot of basic theory and a lot of basic uh, training and technique. So I, I, I don't even have to keep it excluded to teaching violin. I can, I can, create uh, a violin curriculum. I can sell music scores. I can generate sound libraries. I can compose my own music and sell my own music. So that's that's what mastering something does in the long run. And I just, you know, I just want to encourage people um, if you feel like, oh, it's going to take forever. Uh, I don't think, I don't think I'm, you know, the I think it's it's past my point. I'm like, no, no, it's never, you're never beyond achieving mastery if if you want. It, it's it's only if you want to achieve mastery. So let's go ahead and review the benefits of mastery, the personal benefits, 
the uh, intellectual benefits, the social benefits, and the economic benefits. For the personal benefits, you've got personal enrichment, just the sheer pleasure of experiencing your, your craft and, and the mastery of your craft. You are versatile, you have confidence, and you can set amazing goals that are doable, that are achievable. The intellectual benefits, as I've discussed, uh, mastering your craft builds your intelligence and it builds on your intelligence as you continue. You know, it's, it's compound interest. So you, you build on your intelligence and your intellectual tenacity. The social benefits are people, people respect you. They, they love seeing people or they have at least a respect for seeing someone do something with all authenticity, but on a professional level. Mastery is serviceable and mastery for me personally, I think is the most important. It, it brings delight to other people. It, it does serve the community on, on some level, on some respect. And of course the economic benefits is, it, or the, the, the benefits are you, you get jobs and you can find a way to keep that career lucrative depending on uh, your skills, how, how wide um, I would say the range of your skills, if, if, it, if it is interdisciplinary. I'm a musician, but I'm also a composer and also a teacher. So, so it kind of, it, it, the, the skills kind of stack on top of one another. And that, I would say, is all I have to say about the benefits of mastery. So let's go ahead and welcome the chat. But I already welcomed the chat. Sorry, guys. <laughs> My brain is slow. It must have been the fish I ate or something. <laughs> um, but let's go ahead and go all the way up and see what you guys are saying. We'll get back to the chat. That's what I meant to say. <clears throat> Wolf 10 says, I'm drawing another avatar for the Wolf Squadron. Um, but yeah, what are you saying? <laughs> Love the Jamaican flag. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure the context. I miss some very important world event that has to do with the Jamaican flag. Oh, yeah. Okay. Looks like you guys have some talk. There's one for me. Versatility uh, goes a long way. Definitely brings adaptability to one's crafts and skills. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's important to be versatile. And I, I don't think... I don't think you ever have to be afraid of not being versatile if you if you master a skill because it just crosses over to different things. And I'm sure you guys can think of a lot of different examples. Professor Geek says, great points. How would you measure mastery in a craft like writing in which even the most seasoned veterans still need to draft and revise. How would you measure mastery in a craft like writing in which even the most seasoned veterans still need to draft and revise? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're kind of preaching to the choir there because even, even though we've mastered our craft, like you, you've mastered the, the ability to write um, also editorial, also teaching, lecturing, you, you have the ability. So, so you've also crossed over uh, different, different skills there and you are also versatile. Yeah, mastering, of course, doesn't mean perfection. It will always have that ideal standard and will always shoot to, to, to work up, to, to get, get to that ideal as much as possible. So even a seasoned writer like yourself or a seasoned musician like myself, I'll, I'll always make mistakes during a performance. I mean, goodness, I'll, I'll make mistakes playing the simplest songs and the, the those silly little tunes. 
out of the method books for my students. I'll, I'll, I'll play a note and then a bad sound comes out. Does that mean I'm a beginner because I messed up on a, a, a beginning song, a beginner stage song? No, it's just, oh, my, my, my fourth finger didn't gravitate toward the string fast enough. I, I, I had a little slip, you know, a little muscular or, you know, a little slip with my digits there. So there's always going to be, uh, you're always gonna gauge, okay, this is good, this is solid. Now until that deadline, how, how can I make it better? Sometimes it's, it doesn't get better past the deadline or, or at the deadline, and then you work on another project and it's better after that. Um, so we always have to measure, we always have to measure what can be improved on or what can be fixed or what can be revised. And I would say that just being a master is you're able to output something on a professional level. You're, you're able to output a product on an exceptional level. To, it's not to say it can't be without flaws or, or of course it will be with flaws, uh, depending. Um, but a lot, a lot of the flaws that I hear, I know I hear, like for instance, I've, I've been working on my album. The flaws I hear, on the one hand, I feel like people could be perceptibly aware of, but on the other hand, I think a lot of people just don't pick, pick it up pick up things like I pick it up. Um, you know, sometimes I'll play in front of a parent. Sometimes I'll play out of tune and a parent or a kid will say, wow, that was just so good. How do I sound like that? <laughs> well, you, uh, you, you got to practice. So revising, uh, revising something or improving on something or working to improve something uh, does not mean you are not a master. Now, I know you know that prof, but I think that's what I'm trying to, that's how I'm trying to answer. Hopefully I gauged that question well. Now, as far as writing, you know, you're talking about uh, seasoned veterans, you know, revising and editing. I, I would say the editorial process could be much faster. That's, that's the other thing too, is when you're improving something, the time it takes to improve something gets shorter and shorter over time because you're just faster. You just had, you're just building this constant muscle, this constant, um, this constant muscle that has to do with tenacity and discipline. I'm like, okay, uh, you could spot something missing in a sentence. Uh, you can, if you're working on someone else's writing, you can, you can, you could spot their mistakes faster. Uh, I could, I could spot my, my students mistakes. Well, actually with violin, you can hear the mistakes but people might not understand how those mistakes are being produced. There are a lot of factors that go into making a good violin sound. And sometimes, sometimes it'll be the bow, but maybe the student's bow is right. It's, it's maybe it's correct. Then maybe it's something in the left hand or vice versa. So I would say the, the, the editorial process, no, no matter whether it's writing, making a music album, whatever the case would be, the editorial process, the, the improving your, your product, that's going to get easier and easier and shorter and shorter, you know, done shorter and shorter uh, and shorter lengths over time. So hopefully I, hopefully I answered that question. Horizon Talker says, do you see a man skillful, skillful in his work? He will stand before Kings. He will not stand before obscure men. I should read, my my version of the Bible on that, but um, yeah, you know this this skilled man is honored. I mean, if you think about it, um, the the Hebrew heroes of the Old Testament uh, they they saved their people based on some kind of skill. Uh, so, for instance. Uh, now this is more or less. I was. I'm, I'm using the example of Joseph, but he saved Egypt from famine for uh, from a seven year famine. By first of all, he was he he was he he got the attention. He 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 garnered the attention. Like he got he brought upon himself the attention of of the Pharaoh who ha, who had been having nightmares, but he could interpret dreams. 
And so he had the ability, this, this, okay, this isn't, this is divine. This is not mastery. I'm trying to think of some, some sort of mastery. Who's a biblical hero who is, um, is a master? Well, actually King, King David, he was, he was a very skilled warrior and, and a musician. But I don't think that was divinely well. He, God was with him. It's, it's obvious in, in the in the Old Testament scripture. But I also think he acquired that skill over experience because he fought battle after battle. He he obtained the king's favor before the king King Saul became corrupted and, and tried to kill him. But he obtained the favor of the people. He obtained the favor of the king. That that only comes with with skill and mastery of something. Of course, God was with him, but it also was the fruit of his own work. You know, he was skilled on on the the harp. You know that that's that comes from the fruit of mastering that instrument. I'm trying to think of someone else too. I'm trying to think of yeah. I was thinking of Daniel, but um, he also interpreted dreams. I mean, he was a good diplomat. <laughs> good um, good good with speech. Joseph was also good good with speech. Uh, alienated entity says, maybe over time you throw away some things that you learn seeing that are not too important to be at a certain level and, and don't help you in any way at the end. Oh yeah. Um, what's, what's an example for me? I don't know. Um, hmm. I, I'm sort of seeing this with, with super collider because, okay, actually I, 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 I could give you an example right now, right now. I am working with FM synthesis and super collider, and I'm trying to generate tones in a very effective and very dynamic way, a very compelling way. Now I'm learning all this new stuff in FM and, and really important things in FM. I mean, uh, I know how, I know how R2D2 speaks. <laughs> I, I know how to generate the tones of R2D2 because I know, I know the nature of FM. So I know the nature of FM. I'm learning a lot from the actual science of frequency modulation synthesis. But in the process of in the process of actually knowing FM, in the last week, the more I learned about FM and the more I experimented with FM, the less compelling the sounds were becoming. So my ultimate goal, my ultimate goal in Super Collider is to generate compelling sounds for my compositions for my electronic music. And it'd be, it'd be great if I, if I know a lot of stuff of FM, but if, if, if it doesn't get that compelling sound, I will probably focus my attention to something else. I'll, I'll go back to granular synthesis. And, and the same is true of granular synthesis. If I've, I've, if I feel like I've reached my limit, my intellectual limit at this time, at this time, and I don't quite understand anymore, I will proceed to do something else to get that compelling sound. Now, that's that's not to say I won't find something really compelling with FM or granular synthesis, but I'm in the troubleshooting stage where it's like, okay, I'm not getting the sounds I want. I'm not getting the the, the that dynamic expression I'm hoping to get with this method, with with this sound synthesis or this method of sound synthesis. So, um that, that I would say is a really good thing to know is the, the better you become, uh, the better skills you, you acquire, or what am I trying to say? The better you become at something, the, the more you'll understand what works, what doesn't. Um, you, you'll, you'll have this ability to do this process of elimination and, and understand what your priorities are. Sometimes it's, in, in my case, it's nice that I know more about FM, but at the end of the day, if it doesn't generate the sounds that I want or or something compelling, then I'm going to move on to something else. Even even at the expense of not learning a little bit more about FM. So, yeah, that's that's, that's a good idea. That is a good comment. Well, Mr. brings up a good point. A machine can't replace a human being. By that, I mean a computer is more limited compared to what a person can do with art, building, cleaning, etc. Yeah, actually. Um, now, 
I'm not going to create an analogy of the human brain compared to a computer. I actually think it's a little bit off. You know, if, if people say, oh, this, you know, the human brain is like a supercomputer. I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> um, one reason why. I'm going to get a little bit not on the meta, but a little bit internal on, on computer science. One, one reason why a computer can't, okay, this is, this is, uh, this might be a separate topic. I don't know. Um, oh, man, I don't want to get into trouble. There is a reason why a human producing art, even, even by means of a computer, there is a reason why a human producing art will always be superior to a computer producing art. That's going to be another topic. I, I think you just gave me a great idea for another topic, but that's going to take a little research for me. Um, but you're, you're right. A machine can't replace a human being. Uh, by that, you mean a computer is more limited compared to what a person could do with art, building, and cleaning. Well, okay, so... I'll give you one example, and it's just because of my experience with Super Collider. Um, so, you know, a computer will read linear interpolation. It will process linear interpolation, you know, from one point to another point just in a straight line. Or exponential interpolation, moving through data, seemingly infinite data through a, a ramp, whether it's a, a sharp ramp up or like a slow ramp up and over, but kind of a, a, a different dynamic expression. The computer sees an exponential line, for instance, whereas humans see and feel a crescendo. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to blow up your ears, guys. But we hear a crescendo. We hear a rise in pitch. We get a kind of a real angst sensation from this, a real sense of excitement. A computer is not going to interpret it that way. A computer is going to interpret an exponential line. And so you might have heard me get really excited all of a sudden. You might have heard angst or anxiety or, you know, depending on what the actor is doing or what the narrator is doing. But we hear exponential interpolation and phrasing as something very human. You will raise your voice to scare an angry dog away, to save your life or to save the life of your dog. You're like, if you're walking your dog, that happened to me before. Let's <laughs> try to protect my cocker spaniel. So what do I do? I, I ramp up my voice. I ramp up my volume. And so um, a computer will only read and, and calculate. A computer cannot understand that that kind of level of volume what what does that kind of volume output do to us sensationally how does it affect our sense uh, our senses and our, our human experience well it can it could really traumatize us if, if like someone is yelling at you for no reason that, that's just an arbitrary example but you know what i mean you know like you could actually um there's probably a way Oh, I'm sure there's a way where you could put in yelling, like someone yelling or speaking um, with such um, such passion and power. Process that into a computer, have the computer read that data and then um, output something else. It could be a human voice. It could be the exact synthesis of that voice or it could be something else. And I don't think it would have the same impact. We are impacted a lot more by the human experience, not by what computers can generate. That said, I'm a huge proponent of computers because I compose electronic music and I work in Super Collider. So. Dr. Y says, I'm not really a master of anything. I'd say I'm, a, I'm more of a jack of some trades. Well, you might be um, a jack of some trades that involve art. Excuse me. Oh, well, this just says, 
if you make a sound library, I'd pay full price because I know from you, I'd be getting better quality compared to what I heard from other non-copyright music, which are bleh. Well, yeah, I mean, I, there are some good libraries out there. Um, I mean, well, actually, I don't, I don't know the company or the names. I would, I'd have to look myself before I would give, give a good review. I, I recently purchased a, purchased a synthwave library, and I'm going to use, I'm probably going to use like 25, 30 percent of the stuff that I bought, but it was, it was a reasonable price, and I, I thought I got my money's worth for it. I, I also got 30 percent off. Um, so I think, I think, uh, I, I know there are libraries out there that are are worth it. Um, actually, here's the thing, Owen. When I was saying libraries, I was actually thinking of sound libraries, not so much music libraries. I don't want to compose music for libraries. I, I wouldn't even compose. Well, no, I, I'll, I take that back. I was like, oh, I wouldn't even make, make up my own sound engraver library for people to have. That's not true. I, I probably could do something like that in the future and, and charge a certain price for it. Like, let's say I tar charge like Oh, well, no, that, that would be a little cumbersome because you can't have like five people. Maybe I was about to say, you can't have like 500 people purchase my libraries and then use like 10 of my tracks. <laughs> but maybe they could, I don't know. I'd have to think about something like that. The sound libraries actually having like n beautiful noise sweeps or beautiful um, sound effects for something like a, a, a logo or, a, you know, the intro of a podcast or something like that, that I would love to explore because that can be useful. And that's more or less generic. I think you could be a little bit more generic with sounds than you can be with music. Not to say that the sounds are low quality, but people don't pick that up as much. And I, I have such a diverse range of sounds and soundscapes that I think I could compose many, many different sounds and charge an affordable rate for that. But I'd have to pay my mastering artist for that because I'd, I'd still have to have those sounds mastered and then I would charge a, a certain price. Yeah, so like I think something's fun and this would be way into the future. I, I don't have the skill set for this yet, but you know, something like um, maybe, maybe build a sound library for the, these different sound effects, like 500 sound effects, like good sound effects, really effective sound effects. I don't know what I would charge for that, but um, for 500, like 500 sounds, probably between 10 and $15, 10 to $20, d depending. Yeah. So anyway, but as far as music no. just, I mean, I would just rather be hired as a composer and then, yeah, just, just make money that way <laughs> because it, because my music would be, original to, to your project. Actually, guys, that's a, that's a really good point. If you ever have a, a creative piece that's adapted to film or to a visual storyboard or visual novel that um, has music in the background, you got to You just got to hire a, a composer for a, an original piece. You, you can't get music for a sound library. The closest thing I would suggest for a music sound library is a commercial to promote your comic or your story or something like that. Maybe that, but for your actual, like an actual film, film score or a, a music in the background for a visual novel or something like that, you, you'd have to really hire the composer and just do, have them produce original music. Oh, oh, thank you, Big Al. You mentioned liking green, black, and yellow, the combo, which is on the Jamaican flag. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I love, okay, so I was telling the prof this uh, last night, I love the look of um, black with yellow, red, and green. It reminds me of like an old fashioned like billiards room, you know, like that kind of dark, but kind of swanky. I just love that look. I had when I was a kid, we had um we had a we had Yahtzee as a game, but we also had Yahtzee Showdown. And I really couldn't remember the parameters and the rules of the Yahtzee Showdown game, but the board game was like black and green, like a like a billiards table, and it had red and yellow. And it just evoked awesome memories as a kid. So I I have an affinity toward a color combination like that.
Dr. Y says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Melissa Harris says, the Creeks had heroes who are masters at swords. Sword master, yes. Oh, thank you. Ecclesiastes um, uh, 9, 10. Actually, I, I'm going through the book of Ecclesiastes. Yeah, chapter 9 is great. Jesus was a preacher and a carpenter. Yeah, we have to remember that he was also skilled at carpentry. Um, also, the, the the 12, you know, Peter and... and, and um, Oh, goodness, I'm blanking on the names of the others right now. The Sons of Zebedee. Um, they they were fishermen. I, I think the Sons of Zebedee were fishermen. So they were skilled with, with that. Um, Apostle Paul, I think, um, I think he was a tent maker, or he had the at least the vocation of, of making tents and, and making nets. And that's actually, you know, as far as um, being, being skillful in, in a kind of vocation, that's really important as... Um, as a Christian, especially if you're doing ministry, is you don't want to be a burden. That was the, that was the whole point of Paul's message is you don't want to be a burden on a society you're, you're preaching to. You want to help them out with, with food, shelter, but also things like mending nets and tents and stuff like that. It's very, very, very effective for evangelical purposes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say uh, Melissa. So his 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 killing Goliath actually. Um, you got to remember that he was he was skilled at killing large animals to to that that were after sheep. He was a herdsman. You know he 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 shepherded his his family sheep, and so you can imagine that he built the skill throwing stones at you know jackals and wolves and whatever the case might might may be. But uh, yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's important to realize that David was building that skill for that that moment. Like God had a plan for him to to take down Goliath with with the, with the stone, and and he was skillful in his work as a herdsman because of that. Or I think shepherd is a better word for that. <laughs> Let's see what Wolfton says here. Man and machine benefit better when they work together. Meaning, yes, a computer can't always do better than a human and vice versa. But if they can combine, well, something amazing happens. And I agree. I agree. Now, one thing to remember, and I've said this before, computers can do amazing work automated. So they, they can perform automation very well, but they always have to have parameters established before they execute. The other thing, too, is... Computers can generate, but they cannot, they cannot create. So if there are no parameters given behind, behind human intelligence or an artificial intelligence behind them, behind those computers, you, you can't create something new. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting, pretty fascinating. This is a pretty fascinating topic. I'll, I'll, think, I'll think to do a stream about this. I'm, I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, that's right. Now, now the computers only imitates and creates with things that humans created before, right? They can't create something on their own. They cannot um, have something original. That's what I meant to say. I'm talking about AI. Dr. Y says, uh, the, the sci-fi side of my brain is taking a library of sound too literally. Mm -hmm. I can see that. That, that's that's an exciting thought. <laughs> um, oh, and Lister says, speaking of sound effects, which gun sound effect do you prefer more? Uh, the more realistic sound or the more old school sound? I like the old school because you get a better impact. I okay, so you you raise a really good topic for me. So I I work in sound, but I don't do foley work or sound effects. So. I thought I wanted to do this for the longest time after getting my master's. I thought I wanted to be in sound design because I love sound. So that meant everything sound design. So, you know, from footsteps to, 
to, you know, leaves rustling in the wind and, um, you know, to gunshots, you know, to the, the, the creak of a, of a gate turning, whatever the case may be. I thought, oh, well, that, that involves sound. I love sound, so I'm going to do that. And I realized, no, that's, I love sound, but in the context of original composition. And so I, I don't think in my life I will ever do Foley work, you know, like Foley work you would, you would see with movies, like, you know, swords clanging and, and knives sharpening and, you know, recording like a, a chorus of men crying out for battle and stuff like that. I, I think it's fascinating, but it's not something I would like to do. So actually I'm not knowledgeable in that, in that way. I, I don't know what a good gun sound sounds like. Uh, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Dr. Y says, well, Jesus was more than a carpenter on his father's side, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was much more. Yeah, Alyssa, uh, uh, not Alyssa, Melissa uh, raises a good point. Jesus has, um, um, is, is of Jewish or ha was of Jewish descent, and the Jewish people are master carpenters and fishermen. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and. Oh, I've, I've caught up with chat. Wow. <laughs> slow day. <laughs> it's a very slow day. All right. I think, I mean, that's all I had to say. So if, if chat's a little slow, we'll probably, uh, you know, finish the stream early. But yeah, that's what I wanted to say about the the benefits of mastery there. So let's see. Um, I think if you guys, if you guys don't really have any other questions, I might, I might adjourn because, you know, speaking of mastering my craft, I have to, uh, I have to continue with my album work and also, also writing. So I finished my action scene, my long, I had two very big action scenes at the end of my story. I'm going to have a concluding scene. I might have a denouement scene. Uh, I'm not sure. It just depends on the character. I, I had this scene in mind for the longest time, but there's been a change in my my, my character seeing things, um, uh, you know, seeing seeing the progression of the plot. And I don't think I don't think the denouement will work. We'll see. I, I, it's a very endearing scene, so I'll, I'll try to make it work. Anyway, so I have a I have a, a concluding uh, concluding scene, and then finally like a kind of like a you know like after credit scene in a film, but it's just it's more to just cap it off, you know, just kind of close the chemistry the the, the general chemistry of this first installment. It's such a large book. I'm probably going to split it into two books because it's just two too long. I don't think people have the attention span for very large books, so I'm probably going to split it. And if I do split it, I'll probably it'll, I'll probably be it'll be a series of shorter books. I not not a 3 4 part series of large books. So I'm almost done. I'm almost done with my the first installment of my space opera, which actually you know the idea of splitting it into two books now it's kind of it's kind of growing on me. I like the idea of being able to produce two books for, for people. So that's kind of cool. That that's, that's a really cool idea. Uh, but we'll see, I'll have to see the word count and, and see how I'll divide that. And, and it's the first draft too. There's going to be a lot of paring down, a lot of paring down. So we'll see, we'll see. But the first book, the first, first story can be actually divided into two parts. There's, there's a beginning part with exposition and suspension. And then there's a, a very defining point in the middle before branching off into, um, some more action sequence ac action sequences in the in the story so that would be fun uh oh i have a question from a new guy jorge now actually here's the thing is your name jorge or is it george because i knew a george who spelled it like that and he would get mad if i didn't pronounce his name as george so 
for now, I'm just going to say Jorge. Uh, did you ever feel overwhelmed with learning the skills necessary for music production? Oh, um, man, that's a good question. Okay, so I'm I'm a little bit different. I'm a I'm a different channel from most like music production channels. So like, yeah, you you may see on this channel that I work in Logic Pro. I also work in Super Collider. So yeah, Logic Pro is a music production digital audio workstation. But I'm not like topical on Logic Pro, meaning I, I work in Logic Pro. I, I know a lot about Logic Pro, but I don't know Logic Pro like the pros would teach you like in a class. Where am I going with that? Um, I I work in instrumentation and keeping the instruments, in, instruments nice and tight and getting them the way I want, like the sound I want. And I do a little bit of EQ, a little bit of compression, a little bit of mixing, a little bit of panning, a little bit of stereophonic space and distribution. But apart from that, I really don't mix. And I don't master. I have a mastering engineer. So I've, I've come to know, Jorge, about myself. I, I'm a composer and I want my, my instruments, you know, my own and unique to me. But as soon as I get that the instrument that, that that instrument and that instrumentation and that blend just right, and I have the mixing sort of what I want, I send it off to the mastering engineer. So I I I really don't know anything about mastering, and that's okay because I can focus all of my attention on composing. As far as mixing, I think mixing is viable uh, to learn. Uh, I think it's important to learn, and I think it's feasible. It will take time, but there are so many sources out there in, uh, in, uh, you know, on YouTube that talk about your different DAWs, that talk about your different workstations, whether it's Cubase, Logic Pro, all that good stuff. Now, I will say I, I'll, I haven't looked at Ableton Live. Um, I know it, people have raved about it and really like it. I've heard great things about Reaper. Um, one thing I do not care for about the major players like Pro Tools um, that I have not seen with Logic Pro, and I hope Logic Pro doesn't do this. Uh, but with Pro Tools, I think you have to—I think you have to pay for updates, or I think you have to have this subscription where you're paying for updates, and there there've been errors and, and bugs and and all that good, all that good stuff. Um, so so far, I just I've been exclusively in Logic Pro, and I I know enough in Logic Pro to you know uh, have a workflow. Have, have a nice uh, pace as far as structure, instrumentation, and, and any editorial things I need to work on as far as that. I hope that answers your question. I would say all it takes, all it takes for anything, guys, not not just for, for Jorge and, and music production, anything, anything, guys, I, I, I promise you, commit yourself to a year of learning half an hour every day, half an hour, 30 minutes every day, you're going to find that you're going to have learned a lot and that habit and that discipline, that discipline is going to become an, uh, will, will become habit. And you're going to find that you'll do 45 minutes a day, then an hour a day. And depending on the weekend, you'll might, you might have chunks, you know, like two hour chunks, three hour chunks, four hour chunks. I can work. I could work all day. Like actually Wednesdays, it's kind of nice. I, I teach two two students in, in in one hour before that i am eight hours in my, my music production i i've built that tenacity to be able to do that from practice from half an hour every day for five years ago I, I committed myself to doing half an hour for for every skill i've wanted to learn so if it was logic half an hour in logic if it was super collider half an hour in super collider for violin more than an hour because I already mastered the violin. But that that's 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 what's important is if you want to learn music production, I wouldn't be overwhelmed. I, I really wouldn't be overwhelmed because you over time, over the year or two years, if you apply yourself half an hour every day, you're gonna get it. You're I don't know, I don't know everything about Logic Pro and I can create albums. See that that's get get to that point where you can get that workflow to create albums. That, that that's all you need. And then um, after that, 
then then you can decide. It's kind of like what um, alienated en entity said earlier. Um, it was it, it, you'll you'll see what works, and then you'll see what you don't need to 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 further your your achievements. You know, to to propel those those uh, you know accomplishments. Hopefully that made sense. I hope I hope that makes sense. I, I I really if you're just starting music production, Jorge, just just start out small, take a half hour of your day every day, and just just kind of look at the YouTube channels. Get your mind well versed. You know, sometimes I'll review Eli Fieldsteel's tutorials that I've seen time and time again just to refresh my memory and refresh my eyes and refresh my brain on the language and function of Super Collider. So even if it's just taking time to absorb, absorb something new, absorb, you know, pick pick a digital audio workstation. I recommend Logic if you have a, an Apple and just kind of absorb. Check out the YouTube channels that do it. Check out um, starting, starting it out. The best thing to do is just explore. Just start exploring. You're going to generate bad sounds. You're going to generate cheesy instruments. You're going to generate sounds that don't mix well in the headphones. But just have fun. You know, have, have fun with it. It is Muhammad. Welcome. I can't stick around, but I'll drop in and out. Cool. That's awesome. That's all I ask. I I'm the same way with some other streams, too. Sometimes I just can't make the whole thing. Dr. Y says, the, so the library of sound, a massive library containing samples of every known sound, song, speech in the history of the universe. How did they get those samples? No one knows. There's a great character in the Phantom Toll Booth. Ah, oh, Phantom Toll Booth. Let's see. Um, Phantom Toll Booth. If you guys haven't read Phantom Toll Booth, it's a great book. It's a children's book, but it's really creative. Um, sound, I think she is known. Oh, Soundkeeper. Yeah, she's known as the Soundkeeper. I had this one, when I had a personal Facebook account, um, I had uh, I had her as my avatar. Let's see. Let's see if I'm going to share. Let's see if I can share this. Share screen. Maybe. Oh, my computer's slow. There. Okay. Let's see what that looks like. Uh oh. Oh, my computer is really slow. Okay. Yeah, that's her. That's her right there. It's a pretty interesting illustration. So you got these gadgets and knobs, and you can see her. She has her um, she has her hand over her mouth, and she's smiling with a little tear in her eye, and because she, she's she's a sound keeper, and I think she actually has, I think she starts out as kind of a selfish antagonist. I think she hoards the sounds for herself to listen to herself, and she's crying because of the beauty of the sound. Uh, but I think that Milo is uh, is entering a. Uh, a, a part of this magical world that has no sound. And it, I think she's harvested all the sound for herself or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, so she's the sound keeper. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome stuff. But that, that that's what your your comment reminded me of. Yeah, it's a, it's a great book. It, and it takes like an afternoon to read. It's 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 a good book. Full 10, a journey early on sound screen or stream. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. I'm one to talk, huh? Hey, it depends on the depends on the chat, man. Depends on the comments. People are kind of talking about other stuff. <laughs> Guys, this isn't Fan Man's channel, talking about aliens and giants and stuff like that. 
Wow, that was very inspirational. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, very uh, inspirational answer. Thank you. The most I could do now is three hours of production, but eight is amazing. Oh, three hours a day? Oh, no, that's, that's fa fantastic. I'm not saying like three hours or I'm not saying eight hours straight. I'll, I'll have a lunch break. I'll take out the trash. <laughs> I'll wash up. I'll do dishes. Um, but yes, I, I can actually have a, a focus. I mean, okay. Eight hours really is pushing it. And actually, I've, I've, I've noticed this about myself too, is that uh, I cannot listen to my music for editorial purposes after 10 or 11 at night. Maybe, maybe 10 to 11. But 11 to midnight is really pushing it because my ears get tired. My ears get really tired. So um, I, I will have a cutoff time as far as the actual time of day. And if I can't hear very well, if, if my ears are tired because I've been with the headphones and listening to different things all day, then I'll, I'll stop and I'll work on something else like writing or, or whatever, whatever the case may be. It's Green Lion Girl. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. And Disco Dogsy, welcome. <laughs> yeah, you guys, <laughs> that's pretty That's pretty funny. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. You don't want to say journey early. We'd, we'd be like, quick type something. Keep her talking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I usually have, I have stuff to say off, off, of, off the cuff. Um, but, you know, I, I, I kind of ran out as far as the discussion. Now I, I will give you some news on my um, album. So we're, 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 we're gaining, we're gaining traction. Uh, we are on seven song, seven of eight of my upcoming electronic music album. And I think I, I, well, I want to get this out before my birthday to say that I did get an album out at 33. And so that would be um, Monday. Monday night would be the day I could release this album before I turned 34. And um, I just, uh, I, I think, I think, I think it's almost done. We've got six. We've got six out of the eight songs done. We're pretty close to trying to find. Uh, we're pretty close to finishing song seven. Song eight should be really easy for him to mix because it's like 10 tracks of very basic instrumentation. Um, but he, he's been out. I've been, I've said this before. I've said this on my website. He's been out of workstation. So he's, he's been pumping all his software from his main workstation, his desktop to into his laptop. So he's had, he's had to install plugins. He's had to install all this stuff all on his software on this laptop. And, um, a certain plugin wasn't working right. He, he sent me a mix today of my, my seventh song. He's like, how's this? And like all, all the instruments were on one side. It was on, they were on the right side and it was, it was just driving me crazy. I said, Hey, something's not, you know, he had a loss of audio on the right channel. And I was like, Oh, that's weird. Everything's balanced on my end. And then he's like, Oh, got it fixed. And what happened? He, he sent the, the, the song my way and then everything's on the right channel. So there was a loss of audio on the right channel. And then something happened where he thought he fixed it. And then all the audio is on the right channel. I mean, yeah, I heard some on the left channel, but it's like, um, okay. This is how I feel about the stereophonic space and balance, you know, aural balance. I, I'm sure this would drive you crazy. Please tell me, guys, if this would drive you crazy. But um, it's like if, if, if things are too far on the right side or left side, but if it's, if it's too much on one side, it's like wearing a really thick woolly sock on one leg, on one foot, and like a, a, like a thin sock, like a dress sock on the other foot. That, that's how, you, you know what I mean, right? That, that would feel really uncomfortable, right? So that's how I feel about sound. It's like, Oh, all this sound is on one side. And so he's, he's fixing it. It, it. It's a, it's an internal thing with, with one of his plugins. So hopefully, actually he sent me, he, he pulled out all the effects and he sent me, Hey, hey how's volume? It, it was pretty good volume and it was also balanced well. So all, all he has to do is just add the plugins back in or, or the sound effects back in. So that's song number set, uh, song number seven. Um, 
And then we have song number eight and, and that should be pretty easy to mix. And then we'll be done. I would love to release this by next week. I, I, I was hoping to release it February. Now it's, it, it, it's out of my control. You know, um, he was out of workstation. These things happen, but um, yeah, but I would say it's almost done. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to move on to the next thing. I, I've come to the point where, again, it could always be improved can always be better. It can always be better, guys. I'm at the point. I love this album. I've had fun with this, but I'm ready to move on to the next project. I'm so I'm I'm like restless. <laughs> I want this to be done. Uh not 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 flawed like like something I can help, but um restless. And I, I'm just ready to start on my four track album, which I would love to release in April. We'll see. It's it's already March, so it might be May. But I'd like to release my next album coming up, which is four track and uh, four tracks, and it's going to be more space ambient. It's going to still be upbeat. It's going to have a rhythmic kit, but it's going to be also more ambient space. You got got those wider synths. It's going to be it's going to be sweet. <clears throat> Paraguay, you are from Paraguay. Welcome. Almost one a.m. here. Okay. Well, well, thanks for stopping by. Wow, Paraguay, that's cool. That's, that's so cool. Artificial Joni from Finland. Alienated Entity from Paraguay. Matthew Flynn from the UK. This, this is the beauty of YouTube is we can establish this community from different parts of the world. Awesome, awesome. Okay. Honeybee in. Oh, this is on on her on Greenland Girls uh, Final Fantasy remake street uh, stream. Honeybee in this Wednesday. First thing, I swear, Norm Murda will end up developing a musical JRPG, even if it's not a Final Fantasy. Who who is who's that? Is that is that the game developer? Pretty interesting. I yeah, I don't know anything about the honey. Uh, honeybee in sweet. I don't, I can't remember. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's the, that's the update of my album. So man, okay. Today's Monday. If we can get song seven out uh, done by tomorrow and then get him song number eight by Wednesday or something like that. Oh, and then I probably could release if, if it all goes well, I could release it next week and I'll be really happy once that happens. Um, and then I'll, the, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about some artistic projects uh, since it's a light, light stream today. Um, some artistic projects is, uh, so my four track space ambient, but kind of upbeat album. Um, uh, that will be, that's going to be about, I think, a total 20 minutes, 20, 24 minutes worth of music, I think. And um, that will be, I would love to release it April, end of April, but possibly May, no later than May. And then I have two other albums, two other albums that I, you know, I have, I have the general structure of these songs. Uh, I just have to beef them up with my, my new skill. And these songs are between 30 and 40 minutes. I'm sorry. These, um, these, these two albums each are between 30 and 40 minutes. I'd like to, I, I like to release one at the, um, you know, toward, toward the middle summer, end of summer into September. Now, um, I would love, I'm, I'm kind of going away. Hello, uh, Oscar Garcia. Welcome. Nice, nice to see you. Um, a lot of new faces here. Welcome. This is great. Uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm kind of actually putting my 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 myself out there. Um, you know, Prof did Halloween Tree for his Professor Geek Halloween book study uh, by Ray Ray Bradbury and and Ray Bradbury and. Uh, I think he was thinking of doing some other piece for Halloween uh, by Bradbury. And I had composed, this was when I just started composing electronic music. I had composed this piece that sounded really quirky, but it started developing into this kind of epic idea, this epic musical idea. It started quirky and kind of sci science fiction, kind of uh, funny, um, but then it blossoms, it, musically it blossoms into this hopefully uh, uh, something of magnitude and, and wonderful scope. 
And it reminded me, well, I was reading a lot of science fiction, classic science fiction at the time. So I, I, I called the piece Bradbury Lane because I had I had seen a few of his short stories and and all that. And I, I knew of Fahrenheit 451. I had read Martian Chronicles, which is really kind of an absurd set of short stories. Um, but whether the absurdity or not, he he just has this really crazy imagination. It's awesome. Or had had you know he's of course not with us but um, so I wanted to pay homage to to that that writer that science fiction writer uh, fantasy too you know, he's kind of fantasy as well oh yeah okay there you go prophets prophets putting out there from Dust Returned by Ray Bradbury this this October so I want to I would like to actually release a couple single tracks this year as well so a couple albums uh, a couple eight track albums a four track album, and then also two single tracks. Now I know that's a lot. That, that's going to be a lot. And that, that goes without inter any life interruptions or whatever. Um, so I'm not saying I, I'll hit that goal, but that, that is the goal for this year. Um, so I'd like to compose a single track finish. Um, I, it was lost forever in, inside a computer that I had. I had a hard drive. Well, I actually was able to recover that file. Um, it was an old Logic Project file, and it's 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 totally messed up. It is totally awful right now, but it's kept some of the original instruments. And so I'm going to uh, try to release a single track that this October, you know, paying homage to Bradbury. That'd be that'd be really fun. I think that would be a really cool way to celebrate October and Halloween. Um, it's really quirky, but it's really it, it gets into this. Um, kind of epic scope. It's, it's I, I love the harmony. I, I really cherish this piece and I hope I can, I hope I can generate it out, outside my own imagination. Like I have a really good idea. I, I'm just really excited about what my imagination can, can put to the table there. And then if I do have time, I don't know if I'll have time this year, but I would like to also explore Synthwave and, and produce a Synthwave single track this year, just to, just to get my hands in, in, into the synthwave genre. So that's going to be, those are going to be my, my projects for this year. So finish this album coming up hopefully next week, finish another four track album end of April and a couple other tracks, uh, I'm sorry, a couple other albums into summer, into fall and hopefully a couple singles. That would be really great. I don't think, I already know that this might not work. I would have, I would love to do an electronic Christmas album. I think I'm going to wait until the following Christmas because I just with with the schedule I have for my my music, I I, I just won't have time. Uh, so anyway, that's that's my artistic journey for for this year. That my my ambitions this year. So let's see. Let's go ahead and uh, start plugging because you know I could I could I could definitely <laughs> I could definitely use the time to just unwind and. Right. I've also been teaching three hours straight or three and a half hours straight. My voice is kind of giving. That's right, Melissa. Me too. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. I, I, I'm ready for the holidays already, guys. Uh, but, you know, no, we've we got to be faithful with the time given us in this year. So let's talk about what's streaming um so we've got catholic bible geek uh, um well actually i guess i should say it in chronological time order let's talk talk about wcr with wolf 10 uh tuesdays and thursdays 2 30 p.m eastern time he's it looks like he's got his uh topics and he's doing also a sunday stream with artificial journey that's pretty cool the history of finland good yeah talk about finnish culture that's awesome that's great um, so be on the lookout for his Tuesday and Thursday streams and also his Sunday streams. It uh, looks like you've also got X-Men. Uh, you've got topics uh, to to start with. Uh, okay, Thursday's still open, but X-Men Tuesdays. So X-Men tomorrow. Um, I know Green, Green Lion Girl is streaming her Wednesday night streams. Uh, Final Fantasy Remake Wednesdays. Originals Friday. The original game Friday. And um, any, any, anything you want to add or include Green Lion Girl, just let me know. Um, and I have a question. Oh, man, Jorge asked me another question. <laughs> we, might, we might do a preemptive wrap-up, but then I want to answer this question. Um, uh, I don't know if Second Cup Cafe... Second Cup Cafe... 
second cup cafe is working. Guys, I can't even talk. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think Fan Man is doing anything this week. Uh, I think he is traveling with his family, but just kind of be on the lookout for that. Um, also, oh, uh, Prof, do you have something going on for a book study for your professor geek? Just let us know. And, uh, oh, hey, Samuel Proctor. Nice to see you. Um, keep, keep posting your stuff guys. Cause I want to I tackle this question. No, sorry. This is, this is kind of, uh, a little bit erratic, but that's okay. Um, Jorge says, how do you feel about having the skill to create a track in your head? Is that a skill you've developed? Oh gosh. I could give you a short answer, but I feel like this is also a topic, a, a, a separate stream. You guys are giving me good ideas for streaming topics. So that's good. Um, okay. So uh, the short answer is, um, I do have pieces of music in my head. I would love to produce no question. Um, I definitely have in mind many, many different melodies, different ideas I would love to put to paper or to put to the electronic track. No question. That said, I am an intuitive composer. So after my, after all the albums this year are done, I'm pretty much starting from scratch. I, I compose intuitively. Yes, I have, I have projects in mind I would like to write down because I do have ideas in my head. I'd like to, I I'd eventually like to be, become reality, you know, tangible, but you know, I'm not for some of them. I'm not even at the skill set yet. I don't have the instrumentation yet or the software probably, but that's besides the point. Um, Bradbury lane, for instance, I started composing intuitively and I'm only about, um, maybe I'm halfway done. I'm, I'm just about halfway done as far as structure, but I have the whole song in my head. I have what I want in my head. So that's going to be half intuition and half. Okay. Try to get this right. Try to try to get from what you have in your imagination down. And that's very hard. Um, so we can talk about that on a separate stream, but I will say this, I'm a sound experimentalist and that involves intuition. So I will write a melody. I will generate a sound. I will have a rhythmic module that I've, I've, composed in super clatter. I'll record that. I'll add it as a track, maybe convert it to MIDI data. And I'm like, okay, what harmony goes with this? What, what baseline would work with this? And, and so usually I, I compose on the fly. I, I compose very intuitively. I have a mood in mind. I have an idea in mind. I have a genre in mind. I have a style in mind, but more, more often than not, I'm just composing just by the seat of my pants. I, I, I just love that better. Uh, but yes, I do I do have I do have specific pieces in my imagination right here. That's that's not reality yet. And I do plan on putting that, you know, to, to paper or to to the workstation one day. Oh, oh, okay, okay. My prof, my my intellectual prof, um, he uh, he's doing coder stream in a few minutes after I wrap up. Okay, so I definitely want to. You guys, you guys should go on his stream. Um, so let me just wrap up in a few minutes. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, posting more art. Wilton is posting more art. Yeah, guys, I, I, I do feel a little bit like um, this is a little bit disorganized. So I'm not going to go into the detail of your streams, but always know WCR Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2 p.m. 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Green Lion Girl streams, uh, her stri gaming streams on Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, Soundtracks with Birdman with Daniel Heron and H. Boomer, also on Wednesday nights. Um, be on the lookout, give or take, with Fan Man and his Second Cup Cafes and also his uh, Fan Man and his, and his Fantastic Friends on Friday night. Uh, we've got, of course, our movie rewatches with Netter's Network and um, Big Al Presents. He, he's changed it to films with friends uh, with, with the Pacellis. And then also, of course, um, Aged Boomer with Troy Pacelli on their Geeky Geezers every Sunday night. And, of course, your anime rewatches. Um, so be on the look out for that. And um, 
and green line girl also mentions you know she she's more or less uh she 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 works kind of off the cuff even though she has some some ideas in her head yeah awesome this this uh you guys have given me i just want to conclude with this you guys have given me some some good ideas for future streaming topics thank you owen and also jorge uh welcome to to the group uh if you're not familiar with the group we are more or less a geek community yes i actually talk about art in the general sense but we also talk about popular art um and so you are more than welcome to join professor geek my my one and only professor geek we uh big al shipped us <laughs> No, uh, uh, Professor Geek is 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 my intellectual significant other, uh, my partner in crime. <laughs> I guess uh, defending aspirational heroes is is a crime in and of itself. So I guess that's true. Uh, but he will be doing a, a Star Wars gaming stream in a few minutes here, so be on the lookout for that. Thank you for bringing that up, Prof. That's that's wonderful. So I think I'm going to end it there. So as far as uh, I'm concerned with my channel. Um, always be on the lookout for some more sound experimentation every Thursdays. I think I'm going to try to do more super collider this week. Uh, FM granular. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what sounds good. Um, and then maybe some commentary Saturday. Uh, don't expect it. I've been really busy this month, but I hope to provide some additional commentary, whether that's a soundtracks game, SN, the super Nintendo soundtracks or, um, a topic of my stream so anyway uh i'll leave it at that thank you for always watching and listening until i see you next keep producing the art you love and i will catch you later thanks <laughs>